Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm Farina Mir. I'm the director of the Center for South Asian Studies. And um, today and this afternoon is actually one of my favorite things on our agenda every year. It's the symposium where we both learn from our student fellows um, and celebrate them for having survived their summer in South Asia fellowship. But as you know, um, we're here to hear from fellows who were funded by the Center for South Asian Studies um, to go to India with a research project and undertake it independently. Um, you're going to hear more about all of that, but I just wanted to start by um, saying that much of the work that undergirds this fellowship is support from the center, and that support is principally um, provided by Janelle Fossler, our program specialist. So um, I'm going to hand today's um, the mic over to her today, but also start with a thank you to Janelle and to the others who have been involved, our former CISA fellows who were involved in the process this year and in recruiting people to the program. Um, this is one of the really special things that we do at the center, and it's always a, a privilege to have you all here to hear about the work of our fellows. So thank you so much. Janelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Janelle Fossler, and I work at the Center for South Asian Studies. Uh, I guess this is the end of my third application cycle working with the Summer in South Asia Fellowship, and I just feel really lucky. Um, I never fail to recognize uh, how fortunate I am to be able to witness uh, students participating in such a, a unique and transformative and enriching experience. Um, I'm so proud of the 2017 Fellows but not at all surprised by um, how much they put into this program, but also how much they took away from it. Um, I feel that they all really devoted everything they had into designing their experiences, uh, working at their internship sites, and conducting their research, and just really immersing themselves in uh, the Indian culture. So it's been a sincere privilege um, getting to know all of them, and <laughs> all of you, and um, I really can't wait to see what you go on to do next. Uh, as you may have gathered, the Summer in South Asia Fellowship is a program that allows students to conduct research and do internships in India over the summer months. Uh, this program is really unique in that it allows students to uh, really design their own program uh, around their academic and personal interests uh, with support and guidance from the Center for South Asian Studies. Um, I see a lot of students in the room who've expressed interest in applying for this fellowship, and uh, I'm sure tonight will be informative and inspiring as you uh, begin the process in what might be your, the beginning of your journey to India. But on that note, I'd like to thank Dave uh, for having such an amazing vision for this program and making this experience possible, not just for these 10 fellows, but over 80 students at the University of Michigan over the past 11 years. Uh, Dave is with us tonight, and I'm gonna let him say a few words before we continue, but thank you so much. Thank you, Janelle. Um, I've been on campus for most of the week and it's always nice to come back to Ann Arbor. Um, however, attending this symposium, listening to the research reports being discussed, meeting the current year's fellows is really the highlight of my year. And um, I really appreciate the letters of thank you that uh, all the fellows have sent me. Um, it's gratifying. My wife and I read them and say, hey, this is why uh, the program was funded. Uh, some of you are probably wondering why I decided to fund the Summer in South Asia program. Well, the university has been very good to me and my family. My brother went here, my father went here, a uh, number of uncles went here, uh, my youngest son uh, graduated from the university. My grandfather, uh, he was uh, a professor here. And uh, also uh, a member of the class of 2031, one of my grandsons. He watches football and, 
And every time the team scores, he raises his hands and says, touchdown. So it's my expectation that uh, uh, tomorrow his arms and his voice are both going to be exhausted. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, you know, a uh, number of years ago I thought, well, what can I do to give back to the university in appreciation for what it's done for me and my family? Well, uh, well over two decades ago, uh, just before I retired, I went to India over a 18 month period of time, frequently on business trips. And prior to that, the sum total of my experience out of the United States was traveling to the exotic location of Windsor, Ontario, on the other side of the um, Detroit River. So I wasn't really prepared. And um, as I stepped off the plane and saw all the taxi drivers and the other people who wished to help me, uh, my feeling was somewhat like um, Julie Garden uh, as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz when they arrived in Oz and she said, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was different. And it was something where I immediately realized um, India was a land of terrific contrasts, uh, immense wealth versus poverty, uh, great natural beauty versus urban ugliness, um, a culture of thousands of years and Bollywood, um, traditional villages, cosmopolitan cities, um, ox carts, and versus the latest information technology. And I'm sure anyone who's gone to India has experienced some of that uh, as well. And I found India to be frustrating, but fras fascinating. I found it to be surprising, disturbing, but most of all, I found it mind expanding. It gave me a whole different perspective on the world and my tiny place in it. So when the opportunity came to fund the uh, Summer in South Asia program and fellowships, uh, I jumped at the chance. I thought this was, you know, fit right with what I hoped to accomplish. However, I had some uncertainties. Would students at the university want to travel halfway around the world to India? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, would their research projects be of uh, meaning to them and hopefully uh, expand on the knowledge that's available to our society? I hope so. Would the faculty and staff and recently the past fellows, would they help to ensure the viability of the program and have it so it's sustainable at a high quality over time? Um, and then I was wondering, uh, would students be willing and want to move out of their comfort zone, travel someplace that's so different than the United States, um, and immerse themselves in a culture that um, is vibrant but different? Um, would the students have experiences of the real India rather than the India of the normal tourist? And would they have experiences that would be life-changing or life-reaffirming? And um, I didn't need to worry because all those concerns have come to naught. The program has come off as uh, in, in better than I had anticipated. And I, I really want to thank the faculty and staff of the Center for South Asian Studies, especially you, Janelle. You have done a terrific job. I want to thank the past fellows who have participated and assisted Janelle and uh, hopefully provided guidance to the uh, current fellows and future fellows. Um, you know, it's... Terrific to see that the program has been sustained. 
Um, however, uh, as you go through your life and careers, I feel confident that there is nothing you can't do. Nowhere you can go where you would be uncomfortable. You have accomplished something that I think is absolutely fantastic. And I can say without reservation that when I was here at the university, if this opportunity had been available to me, I would have been 100 miles away. I would not have touched it because <laughs> it's by design very rigorous, very challenging. And I hope it's been the best educational experience of your lives. And with that in mind, I hope in the future, if the opportunity presents itself and you want to get back and give back to the university, that uh, you'll search for something that really resonates with you and perhaps uh, provide some funding which can allow a student or students to achieve or exceed their, their dreams. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to today's presentation. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, on that note, I'd also like to thank uh, the center director, Professor Farina Mir. Uh, she's the most dedicated person that I know, and she works uh, tirelessly and passionately on all the amazing things that the Center for South Asian Studies, South Asian Studies is doing, including this fellowship. Um, I'd also like to thank the many people that helped uh, make this program a success this year. Um, First off, Ariana Paredes Vincent, who was a 2015 Summer in South Asia Fellow. She worked during the fall semester um, at the center and then in January uh, disembarked for a six month international education experience in Senegal. Um, we're so happy to have her back now. She's starting her studies as a graduate student in the School of Public Health and will be working with next year's fellows in this year. Um, I'd also like to thank Grace Beckman, who traveled from Chicago to be here today with us. Uh, Grace was a 2000, stand up, so everyone knows who you are at least. <laughs> Grace was a 2016 fellow who worked at the center over the winter and summer months and uh, worked with most of these fellows. Uh, and she graduated in April and moved to Chicago. So I'm so glad she could be here. Um, I'd like to thank Dan Cameron, who can't be here tonight, but he came to the center as a graduate intern and is now working um, at the School of Information doing international education. And lastly, I'd like to thank Morgan Fitzgerald, who was also a 2015 fellow and uh, joined the center a month ago and jumped right into wrapping up this fellowship year and helping students prepare for next year. Um, all of these people were really instrumental to the success of the program and have left and are leaving a lasting impact on this. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm really deeply thankful to uh, the past summer in South Asia fellows as well. Uh, many of them couldn't be here tonight, but they've worked um, just they put so much effort into continuing to be involved in this program by recruiting students and I know that many of you met with uh, fellows from past years to uh, get support through the application process and also while uh, you were in India. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Natalie Andrasco. Uh, she's a senior with a major in international studies and minors in the program in environment and Asian languages and cultures. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, so I'm Natalie and I'll be talking about my CESA fellowship experience working with Frontier Markets in Jaipur. So a little bit about me, Janelle already explained this. I'm studying international studies, environmental studies, and Asian languages and cultures. I'm really passionate about female empowerment, environment, and health. And when I first heard about CESA, I wanted to find a way to combine all of these interests into a research experience that was really like uniquely important to me. So I found this with Frontier Markets, where I ended up interning for eight weeks. Frontier Markets is a solar energy NGO that um, delivers subsidized clean energy products to rural and uneducated people throughout Rajasthan. So I interned specifically with Frontier Markets Solar Sahelis program, which trains um, rural women, most of whom have never held a job before in their lives, to sell solar energy products to other women, um, empowering them um, economically and socially. 
I had the privilege of working one-on-one -on -one with many of these women um, when I went to their village to conduct field site visits. Um, and it was incredible to see how not only have their lives been transformed through access to lighting and clean energy and cooking fuels, but also uh, they're so economically and like financially independent for the first time. So why clean energy and why frontier markets? So um, there are 240 million people in Rajasthan that have little or no ac access to electricity. And 22% of these households turn to kerosene, which not only is unsustainable and polluting, but also causes a lot of health problems, um, like burns, lung damage, and respiratory illness. Um, and 73% of women in Rajasthan between the ages of 15 and 59 don't hold a job. So unfortunately, women and children bear the immense burden of all of these health risks. So that's where Frontier Markets and Solar Sahelis come in. So for my fellowship research, I was really interested in exploring what aspect of solar energy in particular women are drawn to um, in the hopes of understanding what is most important to them so we can market solar energy better. Um, so I was inter interested in exploring if the environmental health or cost-saving benefits of solar energy were um, what was particularly important to them. And all of these questions were sort of coming down to the main problem I was trying to really look at, which is what is the best way to market clean energy products and the concept of climate change to Frontier Markets customers in general? So Frontier Markets was really supportive with me and worked with me and gave me their full support to uh, really try to understand the ways that they can better market their products in the hopes of touching more lives throughout Rajasthan. So for um, current marketing methods, um, I, I found out that Frontier Markets, uh, while they do do a lot of uh, really excellent campaigns, they don't educate their customers on the environmental or health benefits of solar energy at all, which I found to be pretty um, interesting since it's such an environmentally conscious organization. And so during my research, I asked um, people who are customers and uh, people who held all different sorts of jobs in Frontier Markets why they don't educate people on the environmental benefits or on climate change at all. And all of them echoed the same sentiment over, over and over that um, our customers are women, they're rural, they're poor, they're un un uneducated, so therefore they won't care about climate change or the environment. Um, and so while this is kind of a pretty common uh, belief that a lot of people held, I wanted to kind of challenge that narrative and see if um, there was any truth behind that or if they really should be educating women on the environment. So I conducted uh, 10 interviews with Solar Sahelis and I spent about an hour with each of them um, and the responses were incredibly insightful. Um, I asked them about their perceptions of the environment, climate change, pollution, uh, <laughs> if they'd ever heard of solar products before, frontier markets, how their lives had changed since having lighting for the first time, um, what marketing campaign convinced them to switch from traditional cooking fuels and kerosene to this radically new technology they'd never even seen before. Um, all of this was sort of in the hopes of understanding what was most important to them and what I heard over and over was cost savings was most important to them in solar energy because Frontier Markets had never explained to them that what the light that they were using, this new technology, even benefited the environment at all. So what I found was that um, zero out of 10 Sahelis had ever heard the term climate change, pollution, global warming, etc. But when I rephrased the question to ask, um, have you noticed changes in seasonality or temperatures rising over the past decade or so, all of them unanimously and independently said, yes, it's getting so much hotter, it's essentially ruining our crops and lives, rain is just not coming anymore, and it's completely detrimental to our lifestyle. So one quote in particular stuck out to me from a Sahili named Mina, who said, it affects us because we are farmers and we face problems in farming and nothing gets done. Buffalo run away due to thirst, crops don't grow, and some households don't even have food to eat. Um, other Saheli showed a really sophisticated understanding of the environment, even though they didn't have formal education on the terms climate change and pollution, but they all sort of uh, independently and unprompted by me said, along with rising temperatures, we've also seen increases in dengue fever. Um, and so that sh showed that they really had a pretty, um, pretty in-depth knowledge of how global warming and mosquito-borne illnesses go hand in hand. Um, so even though they hadn't heard of terms like renewable energy, once I explained it to them a little bit more, um, what they all said over and over was, so if kerosene runs out but solar energy is renewable, why would we ever use anything other than renewable energy? So that showed to me um, that frontier markets had kind of been underestimating the ability of these women to understand com like complex concepts like climate change. Um, and after submitting all my findings into a report, um, I'm really excited to announce that Frontier Markets will now be using my findings and will be educating women on the environmental benefits of solar energy. So instead of pitching climate change as um, a concept that will only affect you know, habitats in the Amazon thousands of miles away, they're going to use my research to try to um, 
pitch it in a way that's relevant to their lives and focusing on how it'll impact their lives in terms of health, like diseases, and also agriculture. So I wanted to wrap this up by thanking everyone who is here and listening to me and thanking uh, my family and friends who supported me throughout the application process and thanking Janelle and Grace and everyone who read my application. And I wanna thank Dave, um, I feel like I might cry saying this, but <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you so much for touching not only my life, but everyone's life um, here. And I never would've been able to afford this experience on my own and it completely transformed my life and career and I'll always think of it as a pivotal moment in my education and future career. And I had the ability to uh, backpack through the Himalayas and go to an Indian wedding and eat samosas and all of it was possible due to you. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, our next speaker is Marianne Drysdale. Uh, Marianne is a sophomore with an intended major in public policy and minors in community action and social change in gender and health. Hi everybody. Uh, so as Janelle said, my name is Marianne Drysdale. I'm a sophomore here. Um, so a little bit about why I decided to um, go to India and what interested me in the uh, fellowship in the first place. Um, even reading the profile that I have on here, which I wrote last year, um, I came in last year feeling very lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do professionally. I didn't know what I wanted even out of my life and out of my career. Um, the minors that are listed are like not even on my radar anymore, especially after this uh, experience. I'm now thinking about doing an art and design minor and a Spanish language and culture minor. Um, but yeah, so on campus, I'm an LSNA representative. I'm gonna be leading the communications team next year. And I also work for communications for Camp Kesem University of Michigan. And I work as a speaker coach for a TEDx U of M also. Um, so more on why India. So again, I was feeling really lost last year. I came in, I had no idea what I wanted. University of Michigan was huge. Um, I knew I wanted a global perspective and I knew I wanted to become a better global citizen and I didn't really know how to go about doing that. And I'm very much an experiential learner. Um, so I could take classes and explore my interests that way, but I knew I needed an experience that would impact me in the ways that I needed to. Um, everyone that I know that had ever traveled to India told me it was a place unlike anywhere that they'd ever been. They said it was a universe of its own. So one big draw for me was that it has one fifth of the world's population. So without understanding what India is like, that's a whole 20% of the world that you have no conception of. Um, it's really hard, I think, to understand how the world fits in and where you fit in in that fabric without understanding what India is like. So when I started my research, I didn't know, again, what I wanted to do professionally, so that made it kind of difficult to sift through all the different nonprofits. Um, so what attracted me about the Prajna Foundation was A, that it was in the capital. So it was in Delhi, um, which is a like slap in the face of Indian culture. It's uh, the hub, the central hub of India. Um, and they operated in this holistic method with these three pillars of education, female empowerment, and arts and culture. Uh, particularly the arts and culture aspect fascinated me because living in a slum community um, can be incredibly dehumanizing. There are so many people packed into such a small place that it's really difficult to have the opportunity to create your own identity and think about your own individuality. And I think arts are a very powerful platform for that. So while I was there, I spent half of my time as an administrative uh, assistant. So I worked with the uh, managing trustee who was also my host father. Um, so I lived with him and his wife uh, and I, um, emailed ambassadors, I emailed other institutions of higher education, and I did a lot of work um, from the administrative side, and then I spent the other half of my time uh, working in the community centers themselves. So I taught English uh, for two weeks, um, which offered me like a great opportunity to get to know the same five girls really well, and then I facilitated art programs uh, for the other two weeks. And also, when I arrived, I had expected the program to look completely different than it did. When I had uh, Skyped the person that I was working with, he told me that there were art programs that were happening every day and that I could research those and that there were lots of other volunteers and there were no other volunteers, it was just me. Um, and uh, the art programs only happen when other volunteers are there facilitating them. So at first I had felt really 
unprepared and unqualified to do that. I was planning on sitting in and watching and observing. And if you have read the little profile, I was also supposed to be researching the impact of these arts experiences on the kids, and none of them were happening yet. So I had to completely pivot my research while I was there. Um, and so working half and half in the office and in the community center, I realized that there was a huge disparity between what the administrators thought was going on in the community center and what was actually happening. Um, and then I had also contacted another institution of higher learning that funded another program that was really, really similar, and they had the same issue. Um, both had a complete misunderstanding of the communities that they were working with and had really poor communication. Um, and I'd heard a lot of uh, things from these people that were working in these fields that were saying that the nonprofit sector is extremely corrupt and all these things, and I didn't really know how to sift through that information. So I decided that for my research, I was going to try to get a profile of the communities and compare it to what the administrators thought was happening in both. So I did 33 interviews with people from both of the different slum communities. Um, one of the slum communities was primarily Hindi or Hindu and one was primarily Muslim. Um, and I asked a lot of questions all right, I didn't ask them in question format. I asked statements and I said to respond yes, no, or I don't know. Um, so these were some of my highlights. In the interest of time, I won't go too into the specific questions and answers, but I asked from five different categories, uh, which were education outside of the program, education in the program, safety and well-being, national identity, and gender identity. Um, and the powerful takeaways that I got from that were that, um, again, they had complete misunderstandings, the people that were running the programs. I also, one of the questions that I asked was, how would your life be different if you didn't come to the center? And a lot of people said it wouldn't. And when I pushed back on that, they said, there are so many other NGOs that are doing the same thing. But they all sort of had this attitude that the NGOs didn't know them. And there was it was like a very impersonal experience. Um, and so what I found with all these interviews was that there was a lot of space for really positive social work to happen within these slum communities, but the communication wasn't there. So they weren't uh, communicating with the communities themselves and they weren't communicating among different nonprofits um, that were all operating based on the same purposes. Um, and then my personal takeaway was I had come in expecting an entirely different experience than I received. Um, and that meant that I had to put myself in a position to really take the initiative really create the project that I wanted to. Um, and again, that was the, the first two weeks I taught English because that was the only thing I felt qualified to do. And then I was talking to my host father who was saying, no, you can teach art programs if you want to teach art programs. So I went to the stationery and I bought art supplies and we painted a wall mural and redecorated the community center. And um, it was, I left feeling 100% more self-assured. Um, I left feeling like if I could handle that experience, I could handle any experience. Um, and also really affirmed in my decision to pursue policy academically. Um, India is a fascinating, fascinating place to be if you have any interest in policy, particularly in the capital. Um, and I have a whole new family. I just was uh, group me messaging my host mom and host dad and they were saying, good luck. I know you're strong and powerful. I know you can do this. Um, and if you know anything about India too, you know how important family culture is there and I virtually didn't interact with hardly any other American person. I was almost entirely surrounded by Indian people. Um, and so then, yeah, with that, a big, big, enormous thank you to Dave. Thank you for donating. It has been an incredibly life-changing experience. Um, I wish I could articulate to you all of the things that I learned, but I can't in only seven minutes. Also, thank you, Janelle, for like listening to me ramble and ramble and ramble about all the different things that I could maybe do in India and why the reasons I wanted to. And, Grace and, the, and Morgan and Ariana and the other interns. Thank you so, so much for this opportunity. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, our next speaker is Addie Kim. Um, she's a senior double majoring in biology and uh, creative writing and literature. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Addison, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience working with the Tibetan refugee community in McLeod Gonch. So this is a picture of Nini. She was my nanny when I, starting from when I was two and a half years old. And when my parents were busy working, she basically raised me. She taught me how to read, how to write, how to be kind to other people. And she also taught me how to meditate. She was a former Buddhist nun from Myanmar, and she instilled within me a respect for 
um, Buddhist principles and Buddhist practice that has guided me throughout my whole life. And so I really wanted to use this opportunity to um, give back to this woman in a small and symbolic way and also to immerse myself within a culture that was so deeply educated by Buddhist principles. So uh, with that, I worked in uh, McLeod Ganj in Himachal Pradesh, a northern state of India. I worked for Law Charitable Trust. Um, and I like to think of Law as a community building organization. Uh, they do a whole host of things for the community. Uh, the, the biggest one being um, language classes. They do classes in German, French, Chinese, and English. Uh, but they also do a lot of uh, programs to try to improve the standards of living of the people who live there. Um, they, do, they run a community kitchen, uh, so every Tibetan can uh, get a hot meal at least once a day. They uh, do weekly um, trash cleanup because trash is thrown on the street and the city does not provide that service. Um, and they even have a clean water initiative. So they're really invested in uh, taking care of the community as a whole, not just one aspect of it. So uh, what the heck did I do, Addie? What'd you do for them? Um, so I taught English. Uh, I taught uh, advanced English, which meant that I was preparing and um, leading English classes for our advanced students all by myself for 10 to 20 students every day, uh, which involved uh, a mixture of grammar lessons and games and comprehension. And I also even wrote a final exam and had them take it and graded it, which is more stressful than just taking a final exam. <laughs> um, and I think the biggest impact I had during this part of my experience was um, helping improve the confidence of these, uh, these uh, members of the community. Um, these are them. These are some of my students. Uh, they were incredibly good at English, which uh, transitioning from Tibetan to English is an incredibly hard uh, transition and they knew their stuff and I was just there to help them get confident in their English skills. Um, I also led conversation classes which were uh, varied. Sometimes we talk about our favorite food for 20 minutes and sometimes we'd argue about the existence of God. It kind of depended on who, uh, who, what we were feeling that day. Um, and a lot of the information from my research came from these conversation classes with, uh, with the students. So what did I research? I like this because it uh, represents both my thinking process throughout my research. I drew a lot of charts and flow graphs and things of that nature to try to understand this. Um, and I also think it does summarize what I was trying to do with my research pretty well. So I've always been interested in uh, trauma resilience in communities and what makes certain communities more resilient to trauma than others. Um, and during my research, I read a lot of stuff, and I came across some data that said that um, while Tibetan refugees undergo a huge volume of traumatic events, they have relatively low levels of psychological distress. And I wanted to understand that uh, to some small degree. So basically, I, what I did is I tried to examine how their heritage in their community, which is very special, um, I wanted to understand what, is, what, what does that do for them as members? How, how does maintaining a unique culture help or hinder their processing of trauma? How does, the, um, uh, how does understanding Buddhism, how do the tenets of Buddhism and the practice of Buddhism help them move through trauma? And then finally, Tibet receives a lot, Tibetan refugees receive a lot of money from the West through both formal and informal cha channels. And I wanted to understand how that money influences them and influences their heritage, their Buddhism, and their processing of trauma. And while I didn't even come close to answering any of those questions in my research, I think the point of that was the point of my research and the best part of it was that it helped me fully immerse myself within my community. And in, it enriched my experience and it also continues to educate me as I move through the world and as I interact with and try to engage with other communities that are dealing with their own trauma. Um, so, finally, looking forward, what changed for me? Um, I could talk for years about what changed for me in India, but I think what some of the most important things are anxiety. I went from being a very anxious person, I was more anxious than I've ever been on that plane ride to India, to being able to navigate the buses in Tamil Nadu with a roller bag, with ease. And I was able to trust myself and trust the world to get me where I needed to go. Um, 
I have an expanded worldview, as Dave touched on. I, I have a different understanding of how people can organize themselves and connect with each other. And going off that a little bit, I, I found new sources and a greater depth of joy and connection. I saw beautiful things when I was in India, both natural and man-made. But a moment that I think encapsulates this perfectly is I was in uh, the Meenakshi temple, actually, where this photo was taken. Um, and a woman came up to me and she asked for a selfie, as they do, and we took a selfie. And she just touched me and looked in my eyes, and we couldn't talk. And I'm so used to communicating with people with words. But she just looked in my eyes, and I knew then that I was appreciated and that I was seen. And so with that, I want to just thank Janelle, thank everybody, thank the fellows for guiding me, for enriching my experience, and to Dave for making this experience possible for me and all the fellows, and for creating a community in which I feel part of. And I am so, so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Addie. Um, our next speaker is Christopher Olson. Um, he's a junior planning to major in political science and minor in community action and social change. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as Janelle said, my name is Chris. So I did planning on Sorry, I did research on urban planning, uh, some of those uh, cities that Dave mentioned earlier. Um, in case you're wondering what this is, this is Amritsar Gate, which is the entrance uh, to Amritsar. So, All right, so the idea behind my research is that when you make a policy decision, you're inherently making a choice between a certain set of values. You could plan for something like justice or the environment or economic development. It could be anything you want. Um, and so I was going to look at the master plans of two cities, Amritsar and Bangalore, and see what they have in common and if I can figure out if there is one overriding value. So one of the things that is interesting about studying cities in India is just how rapidly India is urbanizing. Um, 32.7% of India's population lives in cities. In 30 years, it's going to be 50. And just to give you an idea of the scales we're working on, uh, even though the majority of uh, India's population lives in rural places, there are more people who live in Indian cities than live in the entire United States. Um, Amritsar was a small city of a million people. Uh, Bangalore was a large city of 10 million. <laughs> And so the urban landscape is very characterized by what's known as informality. It's this idea that there are rules that no one follows, so you have new rules that pop up. And this is kind of what, a little bit what Bangalore looks like. You can see the informal activity of someone. Someone is selling produce, there's an auto driver, and there's trees everywhere. And surrounding this area is all residential, but this is a very commercial street. Um, and what's really interesting is that the, the government agencies that are responsible for planning, they don't do it. They're not good at it, and there's a number of reasons that I won't go into for that one. All right, so, so Bangalore. This is in the south. It's the capital of Karnataka, as I said. It's uh, 10 million plus inhabitants. Um, this used to be called a pensioner's paradise. Uh, the weather is really nice, especially compared to the rest of India. There is a history of the British military being there for a long time. Now it's known as the Silicon Valley of India. And what's kind of interesting about it is you can see, if you look at these purple areas, so this is, this is uh, what's in this area, it's called Electronic City. This is where all the IT is, uh, more or less, and you can see somewhat around here. But what's interesting is it's actually zoned as high-tech development, which is important because this is not a zoning regulation that you normally see. Um, and I won't get too much into zoning because it's complicated and bureaucratic. Um, all right, so this is, this is Amritsar. This is a very different city. Um, whereas Bangalore is in the south, Amritsar is in the north. And this is actually a sacred city. Um, this, this tank, this pool, predates everything else. The Golden Temple, which is here, was built after. Um, and so this was founded by the Sikh guru Ramdas, who's the fourth and the lineage of ten. It's the second largest city in Punjab, and so it's known for tourism. It's known for the Golden Temple, that's why most people go there. The Wagha border, which is the border between India and Pakistan, is also quite 
close by. It's mostly what people want to see. Um, it's a pretty tourism-focused economy. That's why you go there. All right. So just if you start looking at the two together, on the surface, there's not a lot that you might think of in common. There's two different languages, two different cultures. The sizes are different. Their economies are different. So what could be similar between the two of them? So what they both share in common is that they're both planning for economic development. And they're doing this in a very particular way. Um, whereas most people will kind of have this idea about economic development as high, you know, like high tide lifts all boats, right? That would be what would be considered inclusive economic development, where all the boats are coming rather than just like a couple boats. Uh, the reality of the situation is that both of them are planning for the industries that are going to be most lucrative to them. So in Bangalore, that's IT. IT is not necessarily inclusive economic development. Um, those jobs are going to be filled by middle class people who go to college who then go on to be middle class. Whereas tourism, there's a little bit of something for everyone. There's going to be someone who's trying to sell you um, something to put on your hair for the Golden Temple, but there also might be someone trying to sell you something really nice. And so part of why this happens is because the planning process is, is heavily controlled by elites. These are um, the people who are making the plans are mostly consulting other people who are going to help to make these plans. Um, you don't go into the slum and ask the people in the slums, well, what would help you? Uh, can we make like a special hawking zone so it's legal for you to sell something on the street? They don't do that at all. Um, I think Bangalore, this is especially the case where there are cases of people call up the agency doing the planning and they say, hey, I would like you to rezone it like this. You can see where there starts to be a problem when things like that happen. Um, and so even though there is this rhetoric about, yes, we're going to be inclusive, we're going to help the poor, there's, there's not really any system for them to have a voice to say, this is what we would like. And so this is how these, this value gets, gets introduced, is we're going to focus on economic development, and we're going to focus on whatever is most lucrative. So that's pretty much what I found. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, but uh, we're going to skip that, because for those of you who have been to India, you know everything there is complicated. This is no exception. Uh, there we go. So um, I'd like to thank Dave. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without you. <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, my parents and family who were very supportive. And really just, I met a lot of really nice people in India. Um, many helpful strangers just like helped me out of a bind when I needed it. And so hopefully I can kind of like give back some of that helpfulness that I received. And I could see all the fellows smiling because they know exactly at some point you were lost looking for a bus, doing whatever. And you just found some random person who was like, yeah, yeah, I'll help you out. It's right over here. So thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Joellen Pellman. She's a senior majoring in musical theater and minoring in creative writing. Hi, everyone. Um, so I first heard about the Summer in South Asia Fellowship last year um, when I got an email about this event, and I wanted to come for the free food. And I am so glad that I did, because I heard about all of these presentations, and I was like, yeah. I think I can do that. So um, I was in uh, Mumbai, India, which is the financial capital. Um, and it's also the uh, center of Bollywood. And I worked for an NGO called Kula Asman, which um, uh, provides uh, creative arts therapy workshops to various marginalized communities across Mumbai. And so um, a little bit of what I did, I um, was a facilitator and a co-facilitator for um, various workshops, mostly in drama and music. Um, 
Uh, so I worked with three different communities. Um, one of them I worked with a group of kids ages uh, 7 to 14 in a vertical slum in Mumbai called Lullaby Compound. And um, this is uh, the community that I based my research project on that I will talk about in a second. But um, basically Lullaby Compound is a uh, government um, housing project. Uh, the government back in 2000, the Indian government in 2004 um, raised uh, the slums and sold that land to developers and then built these uh, complex which um, are all made out of concrete. There's very little natural light of the very poor sewage systems and very little places for the children to play. And so um, twice a week, uh, uh, my coworker and I would go into um, Lullaby Compound and hold these drama workshops. And um, I used, uh, it's interesting, I actually um, went basically directly from, I studied abroad in London uh, the semester before I went to uh, India and I was studying drama there. And so I, um, and then I basically, I went, practically right to Mumbai. And in these workshops, um, we focused on, on things like storytelling. How do you tell a story? Um, what does it mean to speak in front of an audience? How do you present yourself in front of an audience? Um, and just uh, working on playing and telling uh, stories through play. And so I used a lot of what I've learned here as a theater major. It's an interesting background. And then also uh, what I learned abroad as well. Um, and I also um, conducted music therapy workshops um, at elder centers for elderly women um, in different uh, communities across Mumbai. Um, that was also interesting. Um, the, uh, so our NGO um, just had a bunch of djembe drums just sitting around the office. They didn't use them, and I certainly don't play the djembe, but they were like, oh, musical theater, so you can go teach a workshop with djembes. I was like, oh boy, I, this is just not right. I shouldn't be doing this, but I went and I looked at a lot of YouTube videos and I had the support of uh, the people at my NGO and they were like, go for it. And so we did drumming with elderly women, a drum circle. It was great, it was great. Um, and it also taught me too that it's not necessarily, um, uh, because what we do, it wasn't, I wasn't teaching them drumming. Um, we do creative arts therapies work, workshops. It's using the arts to help you deal with um, things in your life and help you process. And so it wasn't about the drumming, it was about the act of everyone coming together, these uh, women who sh uh, live in a shared community, um, who have shared experiences coming together and using this activity that most of them had never done before to foster new relationships with each other. So I just thought that was really cool. Um, I also, um, um, I also uh, conducted a couple um, drama workshops in observation homes which um, are the equivalent of juvenile detention centers, uh, which was very interesting. And I uh, went to an all uh, boys observation home and an all girls observation <coughs> home. And um, in those workshops, we sort of focused on using drama as a means of um, exploring your past experiences and you make creating skits um, uh, with other people in the center with you and uh, just yeah, a lot of personal things came up. It was, it was uh, really, really powerful. Um, and so these are uh, just examples. Uh, this is a picture of Lullaby Compound, and um, these are some of the uh, children that we worked with. Um, and uh, again, children that we worked with. And so the research uh, that I did, basically, so my NGO um, had, back in November of 2016, um, they had conducted uh, surveys, like lots and lots of surveys, 50 surveys, all written down, most of them in Hindi, and up until I got there, they were just sort of sitting in um, a desk drawer. And uh, so when I originally went there, I had thought, oh yes, I will like conduct my own research. But then when I got there and realized that um, someone had already gone through the effort of conducting all of these surveys, but nothing had really been done with them. I was like, no, like we're gonna do something here. So um, uh, my coworkers uh, translated these surveys and I entered all the data and then I analyzed it. So basically um, the scope of what uh, we were looking at is figuring out um, the sort of e educational context in which these children go to Kula Asman. Ah, I only have two minutes left, okay. Um, I just get so excited talking about this. Um, and so basically we looked at the direct impact that uh, these workshops, these drama workshops were having on the children's aspirations um, for their future careers. And uh, by and large, um, cause, and we also did uh, surveys with the uh, parents as well, so there were two components. And by and large, the biggest theme that emerged was um, the parents want their kids to achieve the absolute highest level of education. And most of the parents don't see their kids um, majoring in anything in the arts, and, neither, and the kids don't either. But the overarching um, theme that we found is that the parents know, and the kids know as well, um, that these workshops leave them feeling 
better. As soon as they leave the workshops, they have a more positive outlook. Um, and it also helps them with their communication skills. Uh, as you can see here, this is um, a performance of the skits that, we, um, that the kids devised and put on at the Kula Asman offices. And um, learning skills like communicating with peers, public speaking, all of that is just um, so important and will help them in whatever career path they decide to go down. Um, yeah, the, uh, just more, that's Lullaby Compound. These are some of the um, workshops that I did with the elderly women. And personal impact, um, sorry. <laughs> Okay, professionally, it was, um, as a theater major, most of our training is centered in Eurocentric theater, and so it was wonderful to be in Bombay um, with just this amazing theater scene, and to see Indian theater, to see street theater, um, I just, there's no replacement for it, and I absolutely love it. Um, personally, I gained a ton of stress resilience. Um, things happen to you in India that you just never think will happen to you, and you have to learn how to deal with them. Um, and I also made incredible friends while I was there, friends who I still text on what WhatsApp, um, and who I'm so thankful I have uh, these connections with. And so I just want to uh, end by thanking the donor. Um, this experience for me would not have been possible without your support, and I think it's really important that we know um, uh, studying abroad, especially at a university like uh, the University of Michigan, where uh, over two-thirds of the students here come from families with a combined household income of over $154,000, which is a ton of money, that even as though with this, we are in this school with immense wealth, that there are a lot of people who still don't have the opportunities to study abroad. And I believe that studying should be a right. And it's programs like these that help people who would have never, like myself, who would have never been able to um, have this experience. So I want to thank you so much for what you do. Um, yeah, this experience changed my life. So thank you. <laughs>
And this is a quote that really represents um, the role of the mother-in-law. Um, mother-in-laws were super critical and central to the way that decisions were made regarding nutrition. So FMCH engaged them through family sessions and really trying to keep everyone on board all together, um, engaging all areas of social community. And then these are quotes that illustrate the concept of actionable knowledge, which also um, was kind of a common thread amongst all of FMCH's initiatives. Um, so if knowledge was a physical concept, then the action was the concrete, oh yes, that woman has the knowledge. Um, so they would use behaviors to see um, that yes, in fact, this knowledge has been transmitted. Um, so I include these pictures side by side because they really show the overarching questions that I found myself asking throughout my experience. Um, they were taken the same day, about five minutes apart from one another. Um, India, as we've all mentioned, is a place of extreme contrast. And I found myself um, kind of asking a lot of serious questions about my place in India and also the place of biomedicine given such extreme disparities and the recent colonial legacy. Um, so when biomedical advice is different from local custom, or where structural violence exists and iron supplements aren't solving the issue at hand. I found myself asking what is my role and what is the role of biomedicine? And there are questions that I don't have answers to um, and I don't know that anyone does, but I think they're very important to ask and I found it really eye-opening to challenge myself with those questions. Um, and it really kind of helped me see the world through a more critical lens. And that critical lens is a nice segue into the personal impact. Um, so beyond being soaked in monsoon, as you can see in the bottom right picture, um, India really opened my eyes to the kind of privilege that we have here getting to travel across the world and just put ourselves in new and challenging situations, um, sometimes scary situations, um, but it really showed me how big the world is and how small I am in it um, and opened my eyes to how just lucky I am. Professionally, struggling through um, cultural and linguistic barriers helped my communication skills and adjusting to a new and um, kind of radically different environment helped my adaptability. Academically, it affirmed my appreciation for getting to study at a university like the University of Michigan and reaffirmed my goals of wanting to work with underserved populations as a physician. And I just want to close out by saying thank you so much to Janelle especially for being kind of all of our rock through this. Um, and to Ariana, Grace, Morgan, Dan, and the whole CISA team, and also to Dave um, for really making this experience something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Just absolutely life-changing in every way, and it would not have been possible without you. Um, and then also to my fellow fellows for inspiring me with your blog post and endless wisdom. Um, throughout the whole experience. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Our next speaker is Neil Swamy. He's a senior studying neuroscience with a minor in, minor in gender and health. Thank you. Um, so Janelle, thank you very much for that introduction. As she mentioned, I'm a senior, which is a fancy way of saying I have one year left to figure out what's going on. Um, so I want to actually start off my presentation with a quote from a novel that has really touched my life um, that I read in the months leading up to my trip to India. It's called The White Tiger. I think if any of you ever get a chance to read it, you definitely should. And the quote says, I was looking for the key for years, but the door was always open. Um, this quote means a lot to me because, as I hope you'll see at the end of my presentation, my journey to India not only had profound implications on the way I view myself academically and I view my career goals, but it also brought me closer to a culture that quite literally flows through my blood. Um, so to provide a little bit information about me, um, so my parents are both Indian immigrants and came to the United States in 1992. Um, if I can get this laser pointer to work. Um, I don't even know if I'm doing this right, so never mind. Um, my dad is from Mumbai and my mom is from Bangalore. And even though I had been to India twice during my lifetime, the last time I went before the fellowship was seven years ago. So for all intents and purposes, this summer going back to India was a very, very new experience. 
Um, but growing up, I grew up in a place where people didn't necessarily look like me and people didn't necessarily have a culture that was similar to mine in any way. So as a child who didn't necessarily know any better, my natural instinct was to reject my culture as a form of assimilation. And as I grew up, I realized that my rejection of the Indian culture really negatively impacted my life. And coming to the University of Michigan, I realized that if I'm going to study abroad and if I'm going to engage with another culture, I'm going to start with India because that just means a lot to me. Um, I had heard about the Summer in South Asia Fellowship Program from two previous fellows. One of them is Grace, who is here with us today. Um, and I remember being in this room, not in this room last year, but being at this event last year and hearing about all of their experiences. Um, and even then, I felt like it wasn't something that I could necessarily do, but obviously I'm up here and I have this presentation, so I did it. Um, so I worked with Swasti Health Resource Center, which is located in Bangalore, India. They are a public health NGO that specifically focuses on empowering marginalized groups. So they work in a variety of sectors, such as water sanitation and hygiene, domestic and interpersonal violence. Um, the area that I was working in was HIV AIDS. So in 2002, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation started a project known as the Avahan India AIDS Initiative, which is a longitudinal study designed in response to reports that some states in southern India were experiencing astronomically high rates of HIV AIDS, and people didn't necessarily know why. Although once they looked at the data, they identified that there were three principal communities that were disproportionately affected by the disease. So those communities were transgender individuals, women who work in brothels and the sex industry, and men who have sex with other men. Um, so my project specifically focused on the transgender community, understanding how structural violence influences health behaviors and how health, be health behaviors influence high, rate high rates of HIV AIDS in that community. Um, and recently, Swasti was chosen to lead phases two and three of this initiative. And in those phases, Swasti specifically works with these communities to provide them resources to allow them to eradicate the disease by themselves. Um, so this is a slide from one of the projects that I did during my internship. So this is a project known as a Generation Youth Life Skills Initiative, which is a project um, that serves to bring together youth from these marginalized communities and empower them with skills that hopefully, as adults, will prevent them from making decisions that have been shown to be linked with HIV AIDS. So this study is particularly innovative given Swasti's past because it's one of the um, newer studies and it's one of the few ones that focuses on youth specifically. So as you can see from the slide, um, they start by providing youth the space to recognize their own self-worth and through a series of learning modules, um, hopefully they will encourage youth to not only stay in school but also will encourage them to pursue work, um, attain financial independence, and then when they're adults, maybe they'll be less likely to make decisions that are linked to HIV AIDS and high rates of STIs. Um, this is a sl slide from a um, article that I helped co-author for an international policy conference in Singapore. And the article was titled, The Outcomes of Underrepresentation in Policymaking as it Applies to the Transgender Community. So the diagram is a little complicated, um, but the way it starts is recognizing that structural violence has a, has a huge role in determining the health outcomes for these communities. So while SWASI is not inherently a clinical organization, they are not necessarily built up of physicians and clinicians who are going into these communities and providing them with medical resources. It is built of individuals who try to reframe structures and provide individuals more um, empowering um, techniques to take care of their own health. So one of the things we recognize when writing this paper is that transgender individuals are not represented in the policy frontier. And what that does is not only does that exclude them from these policymaking arenas, but it also prevents policymakers from understanding the core needs that are intrinsic to this group. And what's resulted is while India, um, particularly southern India, does have social protection program schemes in place for this population, they don't work that well because a lot of them require documentation that a transgender individual who has been kicked out of their home and has no access to finances can't obtain. So for example, one of the requirements for accessing a social protection program is obtaining a birth certificate, which you can't necessarily do if you've been disowned by your family. Another requirement is that you have to be medically certified by a team of healthcare professionals, um, which is a very expensive um, procedure to undergo, and you can't necessarily obtain that if you don't have any money. So this paper just highlighted for me, as somebody who's interested in working with marginalized groups, that in order to truly provide positive health outcomes for these communities, it's important to address the structural violence at play. Because until that violence is addressed, giving therapeutic techniques for populations isn't going to bring about many positive outcomes. Um, so these are just some pictures that I took when I was in India. So this is the street um, that my office was located on. Um, 
The picture on the left is um, a village that I visited once my family met me in India on the last week after my internship was over. This is actually in the town where we have our ancestral roots, so it was really nice to be able to go back and learn a little bit more about the place that my family calls home. The right is not nearly as significant, though I would argue probably as cute. Um, <laughs> I didn't get to give him a name, but he lived outside um, the place that I stayed. Um, and I would say that one of the biggest things I learned in India is to challenge a lot of the myths that Western society tells us. So one of the biggest myths you hear is that India is a poor country, and I would push back against that. I wouldn't necessarily say that India is a poor country. I would say that it's a country where wealth is very, very concentrated, and there are a lot of people who are experiencing poverty. So I would say that this experience empowered me to think critically about a lot of the representations that I've been fed since my childhood. Um, and I encourage anybody who wants to learn more about India or to participate in this fellowship to do the same. Um, so just some general acknowledgments. Um, thank you so much to Janelle for providing me support and, underst and understanding that I didn't necessarily have in myself. I would say that Janelle is by far one of the most supportive and empowering staff members I've ever had the privilege of working with at the University of Michigan. Um, she believed in me even when I did not, and there were many points where I did not believe in myself. Um, I definitely did not think that this was a fellowship program that I could do. Um, thank you so much to Dave for providing me this opportunity. You not only helped me materialize my academic goals, but you also brought me closer to my culture. And going back to the original quote, um, you kind of helped me push open through that door. Um, and I guess to my parents who couldn't necessarily be here today, but they're children in Connecticut and that's fine. Um, I think to make the sacrifice of uprooting yourself from your homeland and coming all the way across the world um, and giving so much to your children, um, I don't necessarily know what that's like, but I can only imagine how much strength it takes. So for them to support me throughout this journey and provide me with so many resources I engage with this, I literally cannot thank them enough. Um, but it's just a privilege to be able to talk to you about this experience. Um, anyone who is interested in it, please ask me a lot of questions. Please ask the other fellows lots of questions because as you can tell um, from the fact that I'm rambling right now, I literally cannot stop talking. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, our next speaker is Neha Tawiri. I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up your name again. Tawari. Uh, she's a senior with a major in international studies and a minor in biochemistry. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Neha, and I spent my fellowship um, in Goa for three months, May to July. So a little bit about Goa. Um, Goa is unlike any other place I've ever been, um, specifically even in India. Um, it's a vibrant place with its own personality, its own identity and culture. Um, if you think about it, it's a collection more so of villages and smaller towns than really any kind of mix of like rural or cosmopolitan area. Um, it's a small state on the western coast, um, famous for its be beaches, forests, and lush, lush vegetation due to like the heavy monsoon season. Um, so I stayed in Porvorim, which is in northern Goa, um, which is about 20 minutes away from Kalingut. Uh, and it used to be a former Portuguese province, um, and you can see that in like the architecture, the colorful houses, and the food, and the culture. Um, unfortunately, I had tech problems there, so I lost a lot of pictures, but this is just kind of like a reference point um, to see how lush it's there. Um, so I worked with Sangath, which is a mental health NGO in Porvorim, Goa. Um, it was started in 1996 by Dr. Vikram Patel and his associates. Um, its main goal is to implement an innovative program that combines traditional biomedical treatments with multidisciplinary community-based interventions to provide better access to mental health care. Um, it started out with mainly clinical services, but it branched out to treatment programs and community-based intervention programs. Um, their main goal is to kind of close the treatment gap uh, for mental health in India. So a little bit about the treatment gap. Um, India has a, a huge problem when it comes to mental health care and access to it. Um, for a little bit of reference, um, so according to a 2016 WHO report, um, India spends about only about 0.4% of its allocated budget on mental health infrastructure, resources, and care, which is on the lower end of compared to other countries around the world. Um, so Sangat is really on the forefront, the innovative uh, kind of frontier on trying to close that treatment gap and provide mental health care access and make it more affordable and more accessible. Um, so specifically there, I wanted to study one of their more innovative methods, which is called uh, lay health counseling. Um, it's part of the task sharing model. So basically in resource poor settings, you try to find different ways to uh, grant greater access to care. So what the lay health counseling model does is you take uh, 
uh, people in the community and train them to diagnose and provide basic sort of um, mental health care and have them act as channels to other resources for care so that at least people, if people can't be seen by psychiatrists, they can at least have some sort of treatment. Um, so I wanted to study how effective is the integration of community-based lay health counseling in a traditional mental health care program. So I kind of explored that through three separate projects that I worked on there. Um, I worked on a systematic review on substance abuse in adolescents in, Indian, in India. Um, it's an ongoing project, so technically I'm still working on my internship. Um, um, and that's sort of the formative research that I'm putting down to implement uh, a lay health counseling project that we will be working on this coming summer. Um, so I'm kind of working on the background research for that and setting that up. I also did an audit of their clinical services um, to see what kind of mental health care were they providing for the community. Was it effective? Was it covering the needs? And did it, was it an inclusive program that provided care to all sectors of the society in the Goa? And I also worked on the Let's Project uh, with a the Fulbright there. Um, so that was focusing more on the lay health counselor's experience. So I traveled around India. Um, so Sangat is based in Porvorim, but um, they have pro pro uh, project projects <laughs> sorry, all over India um, that I got to travel there and interview the counselors, interview the patients, and interview stakeholders who built the program and kind of get their experience on how they thought the uh, model was working. Um, unfortunately, I cannot share the results because they're still in the process of being published, um, but it was a really great experience, and as soon as they come out, I will post it so you all will be able to see the results. Um, so Sangat is, um, was one of the types of experiences that kind of changed your life. It was a place where I got the mentorship, the direction, the kind of support I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, it's actually an experience that pushed me to go into public health and apply to grad school this year. Um, and I got to employ a lot of the concepts I learned here at the University of Michigan through taking all these public health um, courses. Um, a lot of it is theoretical. You don't really get to see the applications, but through my summer experience, I got to see all the concepts we talk about in action. I got to see how the systems worked and how we can directly impact these communities that we're providing services to and support. Sorry. OK. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you um, to the CISA team and the program and to Janelle for providing guidance um, throughout this entire process. Uh, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, but um, through your support and your encouragement, I got to figure it out and go on this amazing experience. Um, and to all the previous interns who kind of gave their own take on how their fellowships went, that was invaluable <laughs> advice. Um, and I wanted to say especially thank you to Dave. Um, this project was really personal to me. Um, mental health is something that is very is a very prevalent issue in my community due to stigma, due to um, barriers to care, um, and other such things. Um, it's something that I've seen personally in my family. Um, my parents are both from India, um, and they didn't necessarily get the treatment and the care that they needed when they were there. Um, that's not always readily available, as you would see here on the University of Michigan campus, or like even in Michigan. Um, so I wanted to really thank you for, a, through your generosity and through this fellowship, um, I have like a purpose in life. You gave me a direction. This is something that I want to work on for the rest of my life and advocate for. Um, it was always something that was very present in my community and I didn't really understand it, but through this experience, I really got to get at the roots of why this is such a prevalent problem in the Indian community and um, I just really want to thank you for this experience because this is what I want to work on for the rest of my life. Thank you so much, Neha. Um, our next speaker is Vijay Bab Babalusetti. Uh, he's a junior majoring in biomedical engineering. Hi, guys. So I'm Vijay. And a lot of you are probably wondering why there's an adorably huge honeybee with an anatomically inaccurate depiction of its heart on there. And uh, here's why. My project was identifying the effect of caffeine on the heart, and more specifically, on the honeybee heart as an animal model. Before I get into specifics about that, a little about me. I was born in India and moved to the United States when I was one and a half year old. So I was like, I'm from India, I can go back, it should be a breeze. And I was absolutely wrong. 
the others, uh, I interned on the other side of the country and it was completely different from what I was expecting. Language barrier was actually a problem for me, surprisingly. Um, I'm a junior in biomedical engineering. Uh, I love engineering. I'm also really interested in the medical field, which is why I am a research assistant in the Department of Cardiac Surgery. This kind of goes into uh, stemming into why I'm interested in the cardiovascular system and why the heart, a uh, specific part of the honeybee that I'm most interested in. And I would like to pursue an MD, PhD. Now, I worked at INSTEM, and INSTEM is completely revolutionizing the way research is being held in India. It's concentrating all of the leaders in stem cell biology and research into this one building, and they're doing wonders there. It's actually divided into six different themes. Personally, I was interested in the Center for Cardiovascular Biology and Disease. There's two labs there, and I applied to both of them, and they both wanted me and wanted me to work on a project that kind of moved their lab in a new direction. One of them talked about cardiomyopathies, which are basically heart problems uh, that could be inherited or it could be accrued. And the other one talked about the structure of the sarcomere, which is kind of like a part of the muscle of your heart. And I'll go into details about that maybe potentially later. So my role. So originally, I went in thinking I was going to work with stem cells. I'm familiar with stem cells. That's what I've been working on for the past two years. That's not how it turned out. I ended up working with honeybees. Um, I started, <laughs> yeah, I started uh, shadowing postdocs, learning all the biological assays, getting ready to work on stem cells. And I worked on various other projects. And then they said, hey, so we have this opening working with honeybees. Would you like to take that? And I was like, yes. Of course I want to work with honeybees. They're adorable, and I don't know, like, you'll f I just personally love them. Uh, and another interesting question that this research poses is why we work with honeybees at all when they're not the traditional animal model. Usually those are mice, usually those are flies. But the reason is a forager bee almost goes about 10 kilometers a day uh, to forage for nectar and pollen. So they kind of represented an athlete that was potentially doping on caffeine as a mechanism for increasing their, um, their strength, right? So caffeine is a stimulant, and it elevates blood pressure, speeds up the heart, but in high doses, it can cause cardiac arrhythmias, which could lead to death. And we want to know why that's happening, and honeybees are our path to doing that. So I went through a lot of different procedures with these, from training honeybees to come out during a specific time, to collecting them. You can actually see a video of me right there, just without any protective gear, going in and capturing one of the honeybees. And this is because of the hive mentality, right? We're not attacking the hive or the makeshift hive in general, but what we're doing is only capturing one of the bees, so they didn't feel the need to attack, they didn't feel the danger. <laughs> Another thing that I did was dissect honeybees, and you can see right here, that's the heart. It's nothing like that small, round, you know, heart shape right here. It's on its own along the, like, goes through the abdomen, and it's, like, beating. And you can see that from the light refraction. So I collected honeybees. I dissected them. I confocally imaged these uh, hearts. I went through RNA analysis to figure out what that caffeine, what proteins, and what RNA, which is similar to DNA in uh, humans and, and honeybees are being elevated. So what is the significance of caffeine in their metabolic system? Uh, so unfortunately, these results are not published yet, and they want me to keep it hush-hush, because honeybees are going to be the new frontier in medicine, apparently, <laughs> something like that. But what this did was it fortified my passion for research. Now I have all these assays and biological procedures under my tool belt. I can go in to the career that I want to do later on and say, I have experience working with honeybees. I have experience working with flies, with mice, and with stem cells, my previous background, and say, I'm a holistic researcher. I think I can take your lab, your research, to a whole new level with my work. It also uh, made me kind of open up. Uh, I don't know, when you go to a new country, you might be thinking you might be huddled down I don't know, uh, maybe even antisocial, but I've made some of the closest friends I've ever made in India, and I'm still in contact with them. Group me, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, any social media, I added them, and I'm in contact <laughs> with them. So with that, I would really want to thank the donor, Janelle, and everyone that really pushed me to take on this internship and apparently working with honeybees, which has been a true highlight. Uh, 
uh, and thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay. Um, our next and last uh, speaker is Colleen Trung. Uh, she's a junior pursuing a dual degree in business administration and, sorry, bio psychology, cognition, and neuroscience. Okay, so hi everyone. I'd like to now mention my name is Colleen and this summer I spent four weeks working with Family Planning Association of India in Hyderabad. Um, so a little bit more about me. So I've been in Ann Arbor for probably over 20 years, so more than probably the majority of you sitting in this room maybe. Um, and so my travel experience was really limited before 2017. Um, I'd only gone probably like four hours away to Canada to visit my grandparents. So um, when I learned about this opportunity to be able to take a really immersive international experience, I wanted to be able to challenge myself um, by taking on this task or opportunity. Um, and so I started as a sophomore last year, um, just entering the business school, but I couldn't really see myself pursuing one of those traditional paths, like going into finance. And so I was really reevaluating what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to explore what a career in public health might be like, which led me to work with Family Planning Association of India this summer. Um, so my research topic was specifically examining um, the sociocultural and operational challenges affecting the sustainability and longevity of a family planning uh, and reproductive health clinic in India. I defined sustainability using these three major factors, including environmental support, population demand, and institutional stability. Um, and then a little bit more on Family Planning Association of India. Um, they mainly provided clinical and educational services to the, um, all throughout India, working in all states. Um, and the reason why I chose to specifically focus on sexual and reproductive health um, was because I had taken a public health class here earlier as a freshman, and I found um, that women and child um, and maternal health was a topic that I personally connected with, um, and especially with India, the large population growth of 1.2 population growth each year, um, and having a higher um, average birth rate of 2.6 birth births per woman above the 2.1 um, geographical or uh, worldwide average it was something that drew me specifically to the population. Um, and lastly, the sexual reproductive health can be viewed as a taboo topic in, given the culture, and so I wanted to explore that a little bit more and um, uh, push those boundaries to see what I could find out about the reasons of how perspectives on sexual and reproductive health has been changing over the past few years. Um, so the main, one of the main reasons why I found F, uh, Family Planning Associ Association of India was successful in their work was because they were able to provide both um, services directly on site in rural villages and urban slums, but also with their central location um, in Hyderabad to perform more intensive surgeries and operations um, and services for their patients. Um, and in the past three years, their um, service, number of services and people that they've been able to work for um, has gradually increased in eight out of the 12 services that they provided. Um, so something that was interesting and a pivotal point of my personal research was being able to survey um, 20 or 34 local college women about their current perspectives on sexual and reproductive health. I found that um, although their information or their knowledge on HIV AIDS were very high, their knowledge on STIs were very low, even though they had um, these 20 year old women were given um, sexual and reproductive health education seminars earlier in their lives when they were about 15 years old. Um, and that correlated with the fact that they wanted to, um, when I asked them about what topic that they found was the most salient for future sexual and reproductive health or, uh, topics in the context of Indian culture, they said that education for younger adolescents was um, something that they wanted to see uh, build up more. Um, I found that environmental support was very high given the fact that the government um, was very involved in, push in advocating for um, more sexual and reproductive health education um, and also services in the area by providing human capital and also um, actual resources such as contraceptives itself. Um, 
education for adolescents, again, was the highest uh, priority issue for millennial women, um, in which I found. But the greatest challenge that they have going forward is being able to develop trusting relationships with educational centers in order to have more anonymity over the content that they're able to cover in their um, sexual and reproductive health seminars. Um, and then secondly, the population demand. Um, again, going back to the idea that although um, students were able to answer uh, questions about HIV AIDS correctly, um, STI's um, knowledge was uh, lacking a little bit. So um, being able to develop, I had, I had a, I held a discussion with the 24 women in order to ask them why, how they were getting their sexual and reproductive health information now if the, it wasn't being covered in their school education. And um, a lot of the things that they said were either from their peers or from internet resources, which can sometimes not be reliable or misleading. And so um, the, the consensus that uh, we came through to was that um, a lot of the sessions, if they were led by peer educators closer in age, would allow for better information retention over the years. Um, and then lastly, institutional stability. A lot of the workers at FPA India were of the older of older age, and so being able to engage younger millennial people in order to keep um, the operations running is going to be like one of the future changes that FPA India is looking forward to as they start building out an internship, a more formal internship program for local women to get involved. Um, and lastly, I guess the, one of the largest part of this was being able to grow as a personally um, and professionally, um, I was able to learn how to navigate a completely different culture and social norms by myself um, on the fly. Um, being able to become comfortable with uh, uncertainty was something that I had a really big time adapting to, but also the probably the biggest takeaway I took from this experience. I'm the type of person that likes to have a color-coded Google Calendar to tell me where I am every minute of the day. So being able to go with the ebb and flow of India was um, the biggest takeaway, definitely. And then also, lastly, being able to um, live with locals and experience the local holidays. I was uh, really fortunate to be there during India Independence Day. So I was able to go see the <laughs> festivals um, and also the Ganeshi Festival and see the processions um, at night, at 12 o'clock at night, driving around with some of the girls that were in my hostel to be able to see um, all the family members driving um, or doing their different like uh, processions and dances to really learn about the culture. So. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much um, to Janelle, who supported me throughout the application process, um, to the donor. Uh, thank you so much for letting us have this opportunity um, to be able to grow at such a pivotal moment in our lives, um, and also to my parents and family and friends who supported me throughout this. Yeah. Thank you so much, Colleen, and to all the fellows for sharing their experiences with us. Um, that was really amazing. Um, I'd like to close with asking Dave to come up and give us some closing words. But first, I'd just like to say we are having um, Indian food, so don't leave. Uh, we'll bring that in as soon as we're done. Thanks. Wow. Um, I can't remember how many of these sessions I've attended, but uh, I think this is the one that I've been most impressed with, which isn't to say the other ones haven't been good. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, you have done, <laughs> uh, you, you have done what I hoped the program would accomplish. And, you know, all I did was supply the funding you supplied the interest, the work, the dedication, the willingness to really try something totally new to you. And for that, I commend you. And uh, as I said earlier, I think as you go through life, there's not going to be anything that you face or any place you can go that will stop you. You have accomplished something on this uh, program that I think will put you in good stead for whatever you do in the future. And so, once again, I thank you all. I thank the past fellows. Uh, thank you, Farina, and the, the rest of the staff, and Janelle, thank you. Uh, I think everyone recognizes that uh, you have been a big part of making the, the program successful. But once again, it's the fellows that 
you know, I'm most appreciative of. Thank you.